And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me, please, to Psalm 104. To Psalm 104. We're continuing with our series of the Creation Seminar as we've been taking time to define terms, to explain what the Bible says in the beginning, to explore the Genesis flood. And now, these last couple times, we've actually been taking what the public school textbooks say. Last week, we took... The idea of what do the public school textbooks say concerning biology. And we saw some things that were disproven years ago. Some of them 150 years ago. But is still taught as fact inside of the public schools. Once again today we're going to take a different subject. But with the same idea. Looking at the idea of geology and fossils. And see some things that are not fact. But are taught as fact. With the purpose of promoting the idea of evolution. For us to start off with, if you don't mind, let's look in the book of Psalms. Psalm 104. Psalm 104. If you don't mind, as you take your copy of the Word of God, Psalm 104. If you don't mind, let's start in verse number 1. Psalm 104 in verse 1, the Bible says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty. Who covereth thyself with a light as with a garment. Who stretcheth out the heavens like a curtain. Who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters. Who maketh the clouds his chariot. Who walketh upon the wings of the wind. Who maketh his angels spirits. His ministers of flaming fire. Who laid... <coughs> The foundations of the earth, that it should not be removed forever. Thou coverest it with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. At thy rebuke thy, they fled, and at the voice of thy thunder they hasted away. They go up by the mountains. <coughs> mountains. They go down by the valleys under the place which thou hast founded for them. Thou has set a bound that they may not pass over. They turn not again to cover the earth. With this, if you don't mind, let's take some time and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much again for you being a wonderful God. Thank you for the great privilege to have the truth. To be able to open up the Bible and see the truth. That we can have discernment. We can have wisdom of what truly happened. And that we can have faith and confidence in you and your precious word. I'm asking that you would do that in a special way. As for me, I ask for special grace beyond measure tonight. Lord, that you would be with my mind. That you would order my thoughts. That you would help this to be clear and help it to be a help. I have no desire to waste these good folks' time as they come out on a Sunday night. My desire is to be a blessing to them. Never just a waste of time wishing that they never came to church. But Lord, let this be profitable unto them and to them all. And again, in order for that to happen, it must be your Holy Spirit that gets involved. Your Holy Spirit that does your own work. And we love you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The passage that we read in Psalm 104 deals with the idea of the Genesis flood. And it explains that in this passage that... <coughs> The waters had covered the mountains. And then at God's rebuke, the waters went down. And we know, as we've covered before in a previous session, uh, dealing with the idea of the waters as they rushed through, that they carved canyons and carved them in a matter of hours or days. And this is something that we believe. Which now brings us to the textbooks. Many people are familiar with this structure called the Grand Canyon. A huge hole in the ground, but a very beautiful structure to look at. And the textbooks have something to say concerning the Grand Canyon. In this textbook here, it very clearly states what it, uh, all of them teach. That over millions of years, the Colorado River carved out the Grand Canyon from solid rock. Now, in here, they say some very specific things. Now, there are some things that we understand as fact. For example, there is a fact the Grand Canyon exists. Without a doubt, you can go and look at it. It does exist. But we have different perspectives. We have a creationist interpretation, meaning because we leave the Bi believe the Bible, we can look at the Grand Canyon and we can have our own view of the Grand Canyon based off of what we believe. The evolution, 
evolutionists do the same thing. Because they have a certain set of beliefs, they look at the Grand Canyon and they come up with a different interpretation. For the evolutionists, they believe that it forms slowly by a little water and lots of time. And so that's what the textbook just said. That that little Colorado River carved out that huge canyon with a secret ingredient called lots and lots of time. Whereas we as creationists believe that it was formed quickly by lots of water and a little amount of time. Both of these cannot be right, but they are observation or <coughs> interpretations based off of, of a clear observation. Now the evolutionists are always trying to erase the line and make the students think that their interpretation is in fact fact. When it is not, it is their interpretation. For example, <laughs> here it says, the Colorado River has cut through layer upon layer of rock over millions of years. So what the textbooks say is that over time, the Colorado River has just washed through layer after layer after layer until finally this huge cavern, this huge uh, canyon was carved out. Here is a... <clears throat> A university textbook that says the same thing. They're taught in universities. This Colorado River has cut through 2,000 meters of rock. And as you look through it, each of those uh, uh, different segments represent a period of time. Now, to understand what we believe about this, there are some things that you need to know about geography. For example, if you were to dam up the Grand Canyon, a huge lake would form. Many people who study these things would call it Grand Lake. But if you dammed it up, there would be a huge, <coughs> a huge lake that was formed. We could see on a topographical map here where the Grand Canyon is inside of Arizona, <coughs> circled. It is a huge piece of real estate and just very beautiful, but it is huge. Some things that you need to know about, though, is that the ground slopes to the top of the Grand Canyon, meaning at the very top of the Grand Canyon, could go anywhere to about 7,000 to 8,500 feet in elevation. That's pretty tall. However, the Colorado River enters the canyon about 28,000 foot elevation and runs downhill. If you catch that, this is an important. <coughs> So the Colorado River runs for about 270 miles, and it runs downhill. So some points to consider about the Grand Canyon. First of all, the top of the canyon is higher than the bottom. You could probably figure that out with no help, right? So the top's up here, and the bottom's down here. Something else you need to know is that the river only runs through the bottom. The river does not run through the top of the canyon. You could figure that out. Also, the top of the canyon is higher than where the river enters into the canyon by 4,000 feet. That means the evolutionists want you to believe that the river ran uphill for thousands of years until it slowly carved it down. I don't know where you're from, but usually rivers do not run uphill. They have a hard time with that. And then, as I just said, rivers don't run uphill. This causes a huge problem when you look at the Grand Canyon because it is not scientifically possible for a little river to carve out a canyon like this. In addition, there's something else that's missing. It is missing El Delta. Remember, the textbooks teach that the, the river over thousands, millions of years carved out the river. Well, if it's carving out the river, then it is also bringing all the sediment and dumping it somewhere. And when a river dumps all the sediment, a delta is formed. But there is no delta. Where is all of this settlement, sediment that is being washed away by the Colorado River? There is no delta. <coughs> so what we believe is that once upon a time ago, after the flood, there was a huge lake that was formed and backed up called Grand Lake. And as the dam broke, it washed away instantly the Grand Canyon. And we already know that when dams break, they do tons of damage and they carve real estate rapidly. That washing water just causes lots of damage immediately. <coughs> so when you look at something like the Grand Canyon, 
we know that there are things in the bottom, but it could not carve the top of the canyon. That would cause some problems. As we move on to a tiny of the subject, remember that each one of these segments inside of the Grand Canyon is considered layers of time, that the textbooks teach there is something called a geological column, and that each one of these strata of the geological column represents a period of time. <coughs> In the early 1800s, each rock layer was given a name like Jurassic and an age and an index fossil. That's important. We're going to cover that in just a second. Now, going back to the Grand Canyon, there is a fact that the Grand Canyon exists. There's also another fact is that the earth has layers of sedimentary rock, meaning layers upon layers of rock. The evolutionists will look at the layers of rock and they say these layers form slowly over millions of years. They would stack up over time. Uniform, uniformitarianism is what they refer to. However, we would say that the layers are from the flood of Noah and they were laid rapidly. Once again, the evolutionists are trying to erase the lines between their interpretation and trying to teach the students that these are fact. Now, for the geological column, it is the Bible for the evolutionist. It is what they refer to to deal with fossils and rocks and layers and all of this. However, the geological column can only be found one place in all of the earth. In all of the earth, where is it found? It can only be found in the textbooks. That is the only place where it exists. <laughs> the textbooks teach this. That if there were a column of sediments, but it also says, unfortunately, no column exists. There is no such thing as a geological column found naturally. It is only found designed in textbooks. If you were to find a geological column and put it at one location, it would extend a hundred miles. And there's nowhere that the Earth's crust is that much. Now, let me take you to a tour of the School of Mines of Technology in Rapid City. I spent my last couple years of high school in uh, Rapid City and I was able to go to the School of Mines several times. But in this display over here, it says something quite interesting. Here in this display, it would, <laughs> as you walk through there, you could take a tour and they would say, look at this rock. This rock here is going to be 70 million years old. Well, at this time, you could raise your hand and say, how do you know it's 70 million years? That's a good question. And so what they would do is they would give an answer like this textbook would say. This textbook says that scientists use index fossils to determine the age of the rock layers. So if you found a piece of rock and you would say, how old is this rock? The next question they would ask you is what fossils are found within this rock? These fossils that are found are called index fossils that determine, <laughs> based off the fossils found on that rock, there would be certain, fossil, uh, certain fossils that are dedicated to each layer. And so depending on the fossil, it would tell you how old that rock is. Well, as you continue with your tour of the School of Mines and Technology, you could come over to this display right here. And here they would tell you and explain that this fossil here is 100 million years old. And so very easily you could raise your hand and say, how do you know it's 100 million years old? Well, the answer they would give you would be exactly <coughs> this, that they would say, we know this fossil is 100 million years old based off the rock layer that it's found in. Well, you could say, well, wait a second, over in this other place, you said this rock layer, you knew how old it was by the fossil you found in it. But you come over here to the fossil and say, hey, how old is this? Well, we know it's this old because of the rock that's found in it. That is called circular reasoning, but that's exactly what the textbooks teach. Here it says, finding particular fossils indicate the age of the rock in which they found it. So the age of the layers are based off of the fossils found in it. So <laughs> here, the rocks are dated by the fossils, and the fossils are dated by the rocks. It's called circular reasoning. In fact, here is a public school textbook that here is one page on the top and the next page on the bottom. On the top page, 
it says that they date the rocks by the fossil. On the very next page, they tell the students that they date the fossils by the rocks. So again, this is what they teach in the textbooks here, is that you date how old the rock is by the fossil you found in, and you date how old the fossil is by what the rock layer that's found in. Well, that's not very helpful at all, is it? So how do you tell the difference between a 100 million year old Jurassic limestone and the 600 million Cambrian limestone? Well, based off of the index fossil that is found in. Now, if they date things by the index fossils, I guess it's important for us to understand what these index fossils are. Let me give you an example of an index fossil. This is called a trilobite. How would you like to run into one of those things underneath your kitchen sink? This is a trilobite, and it says trilobite fossils make good index fossils. If a trilobite such as one, this one is found in a rock layer, this rock layer was probably formed 500 to 600 million years ago. So if you found a rock, and inside of the rock it had a trilobite in it, they would say that rock is 500 to 600 million years old, because trilobites, according to them, lived that far ago. By the way, that's a long time ago. 500 million years ago. Some of you were probably not even born then. That's a long time. But wouldn't you know, if they say that trilobites only lived 500 and 600 years ago, there's something they need to explain. Why do they find this shoe print that, has a, that stepped on a trilobite as a fossil? Where did it come from? If trilobites only lived 500 million years ago, how can one get squished by a shoe? That causes a big problem. Maybe perhaps they didn't live 500 million years ago. Again, this is a fossil. It's been authenticated, and it's one of those great mysteries to the scientific world. How in the world did someone step on a trilobite? Well, someone came up with a theory for that. Of course, they always do. They said, man, maybe it was aliens. Maybe an alien came and they stepped on one. Or perhaps maybe trilobites did not live 500 million years ago. We do find fossils of trilobites and we find huge ones, all kinds of ones found all over the place. Uh, <laughs> as they've studied these fossils, they said that trilobite eyes had the most sophisticated eye lenses ever produced by nature. The eyes of the early trilobites have never been exceeded for complexity or acuity. So if you look at a trilobite eye, they're amazing. But you know that their eyes are more complex than your eyes? They could see more things from their eyes than what we could see with our eyes. Well, isn't that the opposite of evolution? That their eyes were better than us? And they lived 500 million years ago? Well, that would cause a problem. Something else, <laughs> as we understand that trilobites, they're said that they made index fossils. And if you find one, that means the rock has to be at least 500 million years ago. There's all kinds of different trilobites, all kinds of things found in the fossil record. But the problem is that they're fine trilobites still alive today. So if trilobites are alive today, they don't make a good index fossil, meaning that if you find a trilobite, maybe it died last week rather than 500 million years ago. Does that make sense? That is what they call an index fossil. Maybe I can show you another index fossil. Again, index fossils are fossils that if you found a rock and they find, tell you how old that rock is by the fossil it's found in, if you find a trilobite, well, it doesn't necessarily mean it's 500 million years ago. Here's another one called a graptolite. These are index fossils. If you found a piece of rock and it had a graptolite in it, they would say, well, that rock has to be 410 million years ago. By the way, that's still a long time. But if you find one, <laughs> that means this is old. The problem is, is they found graptolite still alive in the South Pacific. That means they could be anywhere from 410 million years ago to up to today because they're still alive. They're not just found in one layer if they're found today. Well, let's try another one. Here we have the lobed fin fished. And they're said that they were used as an index fossil, that if you found a, a piece of rock and you found a, sel a coelacanth or a lobed fish in there, that means this has to be 325 million years ago. That's a pretty old fossil, something that's an old rock. The problem is, is they find coelacanths alive today. Well, that means that they can't live to... <laughs> 
they're not just stuck in one period. They could live any time between this period here. See, Lecanth is alive today. Here's a textbook talking about here, this living fossil, this living creature that was lived. They even wrote a, a book here. However, they come up with a wrong conclusion that they say, you see this coelacanth? This is your great, great, great grandpa 40 million times removed. Well, how can it be great, 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 grandpa if it's still alive today? That would be a problem, wouldn't it? So you will be taught that the dinosaurs lived in the Creaceous period over 70 million years ago. That means that if you found a a piece of stone and you found a dinosaur fossil in it that means that rock had to be 70 million years ago of course we've covered in a different lecture that dinosaurs might even still be alive today that means they can't be used as a good index fossil if they're in a range of time rather than stuck in one period of time so as you look through a geological column you can see that they have organized this where it's 100 million 200 million and how do you know how old they are by the fossils that are found within it. In spite of the fact that the geological column does not exist except for the textbooks, people who believed in it changed their worldview away from biblical flood geology to uniformitarianism, meaning that the geological column and the teaching of the geological column has done a lot of damage to bring people away from the Bible and believing the Bible because they're giving a chart and say, look at all these dinosaurs, look at all these creatures. This proves that the world is billions of years old, which again takes away what the Bible says. Well, as we study the fossil record, there's something else that we have to explain the origin of life. Where did life come from? Where did it come to exist at? How do we find it? Where does it show up at? Nobody knows how a mixture of lifeless chemicals spontaneously organize themselves into the first living cell. Well, we're glad that the evolutionists can freely admit that. They don't know where it came from. We know what the Bible says, and God created every living creature. That God created, He made life. God's the one who made life. Yet, <coughs> the textbooks say something different. Here it gives a, uh, an example of a man who did an experiment where he supposedly created life inside of the laboratory. The problem is, is that he didn't prove how life originated and he didn't show how life could have started by itself. In addition, there's many problems with his experiment. We'll cover that in just a second. But the textbooks say that life was formed through a chemical swirling uh, a complex chemicals that you were basically born in soup that it started off as the rain rain uh, <laughs> poured upon the rocks the rocks swirled and formed soup and that from this soup life came from this organic soup there's many articles here talking about how life came from these different soups it started from this primordial soup by the way was your great 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 grandfather soup well that's what the evolutionists would like to teach you it says, both the origin of life and the origin of the major groups of animals remain unknown. It's a mystery back then, and it is a mystery yet today. They cannot explain how life was formed. However, the textbooks teach that life came, was evolved from non-living materials. This is called the theory of spontaneous uh, combustion, or regeneration, that they believed for a long time that flies spontaneously were born from meat. That if you let, left meat out, all of a sudden flies would be born from it. Well, they proved that wrong a long time ago. That life does not just spontaneously erupt. There's no thing as spontaneous regeneration. But yet, <coughs> many important events occurred during the Arcarian era, as this textbook says. The most important was the evolution of life. The progress from complex molecules, even to the simplest organism, was a very long process. It says the first living cells emerged between 4 billion and 3.8 billion years ago. But there's no record of this event. Meaning we know what happened, but we just can't prove it. It also says that the first self-replicating systems must have emerged in this organic soup. 
Again, they're teaching that he came from soup, but they have no clue. This is just their speculation. Even Ernest Heckel, who we talked about last week, he explained that spontaneous generation must be true, not because it had been proven in a laboratory, but otherwise it'd be necessary to believe in a creator. And here we find out where it belongs to. It's a matter of who you're going to trust. The Bible, but there are some people who do not want to believe the Bible is true, so they have to believe something that is impossible in order to reject the Bible. But the textbooks say that life had been produced in the laboratory. So have scientists produced life in the laboratory? Well, let's look at this experiment for a second. Here it explains here that this uh, everything that he did had formed uh, excuse me. About the same time, Miller discovered that the red goo at the bottom of his flask was rich in amino acids. Now, he is claiming that because it was rich in amino acids, it had formed life. Maybe we could explain what we're talking about here. So here it talks about, has scientists produced life in the laboratory? No, not even close. If you notice the mixture that he put there, he had methane, ammonia, water vapor, and hydrogen. That is a poisonous gas that life cannot exist. It will kill you inside of that atmosphere. Miller excluded oxygen. So he is saying that in order for his experiment to go on, we had to have an atmosphere that had no oxygen. I don't know about you, but you need oxygen to survive. It is part of necessary for life. But according to this experiment, in order for him to get the results that he did, he had to have an experiment that had no oxygen. No oxygen can be present. Any amino acids that are present within oxygen will try to be oxidized and they will combine with the atmosphere. So here's some problems with that experiment. First of all, ozone is made from oxygen and it blocks UV light. So if you didn't have oxygen, you couldn't have ozone and the ozone would allow UV light. The UV light would kill the ammonia and therefore you couldn't go to this experiment. So again, we're talking about this experiment is not scientific plausible because it doesn't exist inside of any atmosphere. Life can evolve without oxygen. The earth has always had oxygen. In fact, at one time it probably had even more oxygen than it has today. <laughs> what is the evidence for a, a primitive methane ammonia atmosphere on earth? The answer is there's no evidence, but very much against it. There's never been a time where our with, where our earth was without oxygen. In general, we find no evidence that sedimentary distribution of carbon, sulfur, uranium, or iron, that of an oxygen-free atmosphere existed at any time. Here is people that um, are not even creationists that are saying this, this experiment was a flop. It could not exist. It is suggested that even from the time of the earliest dated rocks at 3.7 billion years ago, the earth had an oxygenic atmosphere. Again, even the evolutionists say we have always had oxygen inside of our atmosphere. The only trend in recent literature is the suggestion of far more oxygen in the early atmosphere than anyone had imagined. <laughs> Here again, it's talking about there was probably more oxygen. Now, with all of that here, you would almost think that the textbooks would fall in line with the evidence that we've always had oxygen. But you know what the textbooks do? In order to validate that other experiment, they will give the students a chart like this, and they will say that there was no oxygen in the beginning of time, which goes against all evidence, but this is the only way they could validate that experiment they teach in the textbook that life was created inside of the laboratory. Another problem is that it was a filtered out product. The problem, it's not realistic for nature. It was not reproducible, by the way. They have never been able to reproduce that experiment that claimed that they created life. In addition, it made 85% tar, by the way, that is poisonous, as well as carbolic acid. Both of them are toxic and only 2% amino acids. The problems with this is that only two amino acids were produced where 20 different amino acids are needed in order for life to be in existence. Second of all, the amino acids immediately bonded with the tar and the acid, meaning that they could not combine with anything else and they would die. Another problem with that experiment is that amino acids are like letters 
which are building blocks to make words, to make paragraphs, to make books. For example, if you are going to write a great masterpiece, you don't take your alphabet soup and dump it on the floor and say, what do we have here? That's now how it works. That if you're going to write a great masterpiece, any English literature person will tell you, you have to use forethought and use the words correctly and put them together. And there's design behind it. You don't accidentally get an encyclopedia by getting all the alphabet soup and dumping it out. It does not work that way. However, in Miller's experiments, he made the equivalent of a few letters when in reality he needed to make a huge book. That's all he did was dump his alphabet soup and say, hey, look, there's a couple of letters there. That doesn't show life. It shows that you spilt the soup. <coughs> As we go with that experiment a little bit more, I know it's a little bit more technical tonight, but we're trying to show... <laughs> Things that are taught in the textbook as fact that could not have existed. Going back to Miller's experiment, half of the amino acids he produced were left-handed and the other half right-handed. What do we mean by this? By which way the letters are facing. That unless you're reading in Russia, Russian, all the letters face the right direction in order for us to read and have a coherent thought. But when he spilt the soup, the letters were facing all different directions. It doesn't work that way to combine. The smallest proteins have about 70 to 100 amino acids in a precise order, all of them facing the same direction. Whereas DNA and RNA have it going the other direction, but they're all facing the, the same direction. This is very puzzling fact. All proteins that have been investigated obtained from animals or plants, higher organisms and simple organisms, from bacteria, molds, even viruses, are found to be made of left-handed amino acids, meaning they're all facing the same direction. Going back to the problems with the experiments, that hundreds of amino acids must combine to make proteins. Now again, that's not even life. These amino acids combine to make proteins, yet they unbond in water faster then they bond. Now this is important because, see if you're paying attention, where did they say life was formed? It was formed in soup. And last time I looked, oceans were made out of water. So, again, they're saying that life must have formed from the soup. However, life could not formed within the soup because of something called Brownian motion. That the Brownian motion would drive the amino acids away from each other faster than they could combine to each other. There would not be an equilibrium for them to create. This is a big problem. <laughs> if, by the way, if all that is needed for life to evolve is just having the proper molecules, then how about we do this? Let's put a frog in a blender. Doesn't a frog have all the molecules needed for life? Well, let's put it in a blender and turn it on and see if we get something alive coming out of it. Does that work? Not at all. Well, someone asked a question a couple weeks ago. Let me answer that question now as we cover something else covered in the textbooks. Did dinosaurs turn into birds? Where did we get birds from? Did they come from dinosaurs? Well, that's a very common teaching. Well, the Bible says something different. The Bible says that God created the winged fowl after his kind, and he created on the fifth day. So birds were made on what day? Day five. Then God said that he made every creeping thing and the beast of the earth and every creepy thing on the sixth day. So what day were dinosaurs made? Six. Well, that shows that even in the Bible that birds could not have come from dinosaurs because birds were made a day before the dinosaurs. But yet, this, you'll find articles like this all the time that dinosaurs are alive they're just birds. You'll find all kinds of things today speaking about this, that the dinosaurs unveil missing links of birds and dinosaurs, and they come with <coughs> these different articles here. Here's another National Geographic explaining this bird-type creature, and they'll explain here that the, the dinosaurs slowly turn into these birds. Well, is this something that's plausible? Is this something... Well, they found that one of these that they experiment was actually a fraud, that they found bird pieces and dinosaur pieces and someone tried to put them together, but it doesn't work quite that away. <laughs> Here's a textbook here that says, birds are the descendants of dinosaurs. And they say how we know <laughs> is because they look similar. There's a lot of similar features. So is it a type of thing where dinosaurs turned into birds? Is it an idea of just putting some 
feathers on a dinosaur and say, you could fly, you can do it? Well, if you'll notice, there's a lot of different changes that have to happen in order for a dinosaur to turn into a bird. So much that we would call this a fairy tale. It doesn't happen. Let me show you what the textbooks say. <coughs> Here, it points out that the fossils of the Arpeotrix, which is a type of bird that I was taught as a kid growing up in school, and I love to study the Arpeotrix, you know, this impressive bird here. But as they studied it, they found that it's not a dinosaur at all, but it is a perching bird. And there's nothing to change it that it is a type of bird and was never a dinosaur. The Arpeotrix, the textbooks say, had the brain features of a bird equipped for flight. Now, the word Arpeotrix means ancient wing. And the, but the textbooks will say, we can see this is slowly turning from a dinosaur to a bird because it has claws at the end of its wings. This is how we know it was a dinosaur. But did you know that there's many birds that have claws on their wings? Stuff like swans, ibises, other birds have wing claws. Just because it has wings on their, or claws on their wings mean, doesn't mean it came from a dinosaur. Some other people will say, well, we know that this is turning from a dinosaur because it's got teeth. Well, you understand there's other birds that have teeth. Just because it has teeth doesn't mean that it's coming from a dinosaur. Here is a, uh, <coughs> a bird here that possesses 48 teeth. By the way, some of you have teeth and others don't. That doesn't mean you're turning into something, right? <coughs> In addition, there is a couple Arpeotrixes that they were able to find that show that they, uh, <coughs> that they were birds the whole time. Now, another reason why people would say that the birds have turned into dinosaurs is because that bird feathers evolved from the same scales protected from the dinosaurs. And they will teach that these bird feathers come from the same materials that are made from the scales. Well, is it true that this happened by chance, these beautiful feathers? They'll go on and explain that keratin, that both bird uh, feathers and the uh, scales of lizards are made of the same material, keratin. By the way, may I take a pause? That you have keratin inside of your body? That the same material that your fingernails are made of is the same material your hair is made out of. Does that mean you're evolving to something else? No, God was wise and was able to use the same building block materials to get across what he wanted. <coughs> so... <coughs> Again, they, they're trying to carry the idea, but going from scales to feathers is a major change. In addition, another major change that they have is the idea of the lung system. That lungs of, of birds are completely different. The way that the lungs of birds are developed into is so when a bird is flying, it breathes at the same time, all the air goes into all its different lungs. And it has a complex lung system, which is different than a dinosaur. So, <laughs> in addition, the, we find bird uh, fossils that are older than the, even the Opriotrix, showing that birds existed even before this transitional bird. So here's some problems with the reptiles turning into birds. First of all, their lungs are completely different. That is a major change to go from two lungs to seven lungs. That is, an, that is a hard change to cover, overcome. In addition, modern birds are found in layers lower than even the dinosaurs. So dinosaurs could turn into birds if the birds were supposedly older. Scales and feathers attach to the body differently. So even though they may be made out of the same material, they attach to the body differently. Another problem is that the birds have a four-chambered heart and reptiles have a three-chambered heart. Something else that is different is that reptiles lay leathery eggs Unlike birds, they're, they're, <coughs> there's many different changes that could not happen over a slow period. The origin of the bird is largely a matter of deduction. There is no fossil evidence that show these changes from a reptile to a bird. In addition, even the experts disagree about the evidence. They fight among themselves. Plus, we don't observe it today. For example, when you're looking at the crows in your yard or the ducks or the geese, you don't see them turning into something else. And you're not going up there saying, here, lizard, 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 and watch that lizard turn into something else. It's something that is not observable in science today. 
And all they have for evidence is just stories how it may happen. This violates observable science and God's word. <clears throat> Richard Dawkins said this. He, he's an evolutionist. You may probably have heard of him. He said it is absolutely safe to say that if you met someone who claims not to believe in evolution, that person is ignorant, stupid, or insane. Well, that's a problem. But this is what the evolutionists try to teach us, is that anyone who does not believe in evolution, that's because there's something wrong with us. Well, I don't believe there's something wrong with you. I believe the Bible, and I hope that you do too. Evolution is not a fact. Evolution doesn't even qualify as a theory or a hypothesis. It is a metaphysical research program, and it's not really a testable science, meaning you can't test it, you can't observe it. It is just something that is a philosophy. Jesus says this, Jesus said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. It is logical and intelligent to believe in a creator. We should believe God with our mind. We know that the devil, he speaketh a lie and he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Whereas God, his word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. His word is truth. Which brings us to a question. How will a child view the world after 12 or 16 years inside of a school system where they're taught the Bible's not true and God's not re real? After 12 to 16 years of being taught that, don't you think that it will affect a child? Don't you affect, think it will affect how he accepts God and how he looks at God? Evolution is unproved and unprovable. Here's an evolutionist that says this. We believe it only because the alternative is special creation, and that is unthinkable. There are evolutionists that will freely say, and there's tons of quotes by them, we do not believe in the Bible, not because there's not any evidence for it, it's just because we don't want any God to tell us what to do. See, that's where it comes up to, who is going to be God, them or God himself? Someone else was asked the question, why did all the scientists jump at Darwin's ideas? Well, I suppose the reason why we leapt at the origin of species was the idea of God interfered with our sexual mores. Meaning that when you take God out of the equation, that people do all kinds of crazy things. And we're living in a society now that we're seeing the unthinkable because God has been removed from people's minds and from people's thinkings. The Bible speaks about this in Romans chapter 1. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. The Bible goes on and says, For this cause God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. And there are many people who are believing a lie. That Satan loves to fool them. He's keep going, keep going, evolution's right. And all that's going to happen is that Satan is going to lead all these people to hell because he wants to destroy all of mankind. Whereas Satan's a liar, we know that God is not. The Bible says God is not a man that he should lie. In the book of Titus, it says, In the hope of eternal life which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. You see, all of this is an attack on God and your view of God. Can you trust God? Or is God a liar? Can you believe what God said? Or does God not know what he's talking about? All of this is to underscore Satan's plan to try to destroy your faith in God and his word. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for you being a wonderful God. And as we come up to you today, I'm just asking that you would give grace and mercy. That you would give help to these good folks and that you would just be a blessing to them. Lord, again, I know this is a lot of information, but this is things that we need to know, just maybe not all the nuts and bolts of it, but just to be encouraged that there is evidence that we're not crazy. There is evidence that the Bible is true and that we could trust in them. Again, I'm asking that you would help somebody tonight, help them to be encouraged in their faith that they can trust in your precious word.